Thank you for joining us for the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Safe School Environments and Chemical Safety. My name is Doug Farquhar, and I'm the uh, Director for Environmental Health at NCSL, and I'll be moderating today's webinar, which will induce legislators to efforts by the CDC, ATSCR, and EPA to ensure that chemicals used in schools are handled safely and responsibly by the students. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few, a few housekeeping items. Our webinar today is being recorded, and registrants will be able to access a recording of the webinar and presentation of the slides on the NCSL website. We will send out a notice shortly with a link to these resources. Our speakers today are uh, Anna, Ayana Anderson, Lieutenant Commander with the U.S. Public Health Service, Anna Pomale, uh, Health Education and Community Involvement Coordinator, ATSDR, and Dwight Peavy, Senior Scientist with US EPA Region 1. Our presenters will be answering questions at the end of the, all presentations. Please type your questions into the question box on the right side of the screen anytime during the webinar. With that, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker, Ayana Anderson with ATSDR. Ayana? Thank you, Doug. All right, today I'm going to give a review of acute chemical releases in school settings. Um, Doug already told you who I was, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. First, I'm going to give a little background information about our agency. So the Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry is a federal agency under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The sister agency of the Center for Disease Control. However, we're responsible for environmental health related issues. And we're also located in Atlanta, like CDC is. So about four years ago, we, ATSCR, in conjunction with the Interstate Chemical Threats Work Group, did a series of webinars. So before I talk about the webinars, let me give you a little brief information about the ICTW. It's a local, state, and federal agency network um, for sharing of knowledge, materials, resources to define the role in state and local agencies in chemical terrorism events. So we did four presentations from October 2011 to January 2012. And each um, webinar had three to four presenters. And as you can see, we had a variety of topics. We had mercury, cleaning products, pesticides, and chemicals in school settings. And Presenters came from various areas of public health entities. We had people from Environmental Protection Agency, ATSDR, state, local health departments, and other private entities like Green Solutions. So I want to discuss a few of our key messages that we received from the webinars. So. Regarding our Mercury webinar, I don't want to go into too much detail because Anna Pomalis will be discussing this topic, so I'll give you a very brief summary of our findings from the webinars. First, I want to describe Mercury. It's a shiny, odorless liquid found in thermometers, barometers, and batteries. And from our webinar proceedings, we found that the New York State Department of Public Health developed webinar, I mean brochures, in order to support implementation of New York uh, State Mercury um, Consumer Laws. And it basically helps school personnel to identify resources to reduce or eliminate mercury spills. Also, we just uh, found that ATSDR has a website called Don't Mess With Mercury, and Anna will get into more detail about this. But basically, it's a website full of resources for students and teachers to help mitigate mercury spills. Also through our webinars, we found out there, there are a bunch of states that actually have legislation that bans or require reduction of mercury in schools. Some states have regulations that restrict selling lamps that contain mercury to schools or require schools to evaluate the uses of these lamps and seek alternatives. There are approximately 19 states the last time we checked. Um, example of one of the laws was California schools prohibited from purchasing 
elementary elemental mercury mercury compounds and mercury added to laboratory measurement devices, except for when school districts determine there's no adequate substitute. So for cleaner products, one of the concerns about cleaner products is some of the products like bleach, ammonia, acids, et cetera, um, has as managers. And so we want to prevent this exposure to children because it's a vulnerable population. So a few examples that we received from the webinars were um, the California Department of Public Health Cleaning for Asthma Safe Schools, which is called CLASS. And they provide technical support and training to California school districts to switch to better alternative, safer uh, cleaning materials. We also have a few states that have school policies in order to implement green cleaning policies. Um, there were actually 10 states. And the green cleaning pro policies sort of vary, but basically they refer to the standardized um, green certification acts such as these pictures that are listed below ecological green seal design for environmental to decide what cleaning, problem, cleaning chemicals are safer to use. An example of this was uh, Connecticut had an act that requires schools to use environmental preferable cleaning products for schools and prohibited staff and parents from bringing school products into the school. So pesticides, they're used to keep the environment free of unwanted pests. However, it can be a health risk to students and school personnel. One example of this is uh, pesticide drift. Drift can result from wind or rain and it spreads the pesticides from their intended location. It also can occur like if a school bus is driving while pesticides are being laid out, drift can occur in that instance. So one good operating uh, practice was the Integrated Pest Management Program. And this program focuses on using information on pest life cycles to manage pests in addition to the methods that cause the least harm to people, property, and environment. And a good example um, is California. They implemented a policy in order to prevent pesticide drifts called the California Agriculture Commissioners Act. So part of their policy was you had if uh, anybody was laying, laying down pesticides, they had to inform the CAC 48 hours before use. Also, the pesticides cannot be applied between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. because this is when school children are in session, are going home, are going to school. And also, um, pesticide um, applicators have to be certified. So you see right here is a picture of what some school labs look like. And school labs could lead to adverse chemical releases. One um, is mercury is the most common chem chemical release and other chemicals that could be released um, are like acids and they can cause respiratory skin and irritation. And part of the problem is the storage. As we can see in these pictures, there's a bunch of bottles that are not marked and they're just out in the open or they're not in a locked uh, room. So therefore, the Integrated Chemical Management Program, ICM, was implemented. And the part of this program includes inventory database that keeps facilities aware of chemicals stored and used which reduces chemical releases, ensures safety, and minimizes waste and pollution to save money. Money. So basically, they use a pharmacy approach. All the chemicals are in a controlled stock room in one location, and they're removed when they're needed, um, and they have to be brought back, whatever's left over. And so all the chemicals are taken out of the classroom and just in one central location and they're inspected, sorted, and inventory, and they are properly labeled. We also have a real-time chemical database to keep up with the amount of chemicals and what chemicals are being taken out, what chemicals are in. And they have a, a gatekeeper. So the gatekeeper is the one that 
inventory, keeps inventory that makes sure everything's labeled, makes sure everything is controlled, makes sure everything's in the area. And also is also helpful with controlling the purchase of the chemicals. So after participating in these webinars, ATSDR wanted to see what our chemical surveillance system was showing about acute chemical releases in school settings. So we want to look at our data. So we want to look at our hazardous substance emergency event surveillance system and our national toxic substance incidence program surveillance system. Before I give you the outcomes from our findings, I want to give you a little bit of background information about our surveillance system. So the Hazardous Substance Emergency Event Surveillance System, better known as HSEES, existed from 1990 to 2009. We had cooperative agreements with 14 states, which include Colorado, Florida, Iowa, Louisiana, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, Texas, Utah, Washington, and Wisconsin. States use various resources to collect data about spills. So they use Department of Transportation, National Response Center, State Health Departments, Media, Poison Control Centers, local Environmental Protection Agency, Police and Fire Departments to capture acute chemical releases, which acute is chemical releases that occur less than 72 hours. And we also documented the public health impact, which include injuries, where the chemicals took place, um, were there any evacuations, what type of injuries that occur, what are the contributing factors. And all this information was entered in a web-based database so we can prevent future morbidity and mortality. Well, in 2010, we began our National Toxic Substance Incidence Program, NSIP. It's more comprehensive. We still have the state component. However, instead of, we also added other components. And we also included a petroleum release component if it had a public health outcome, whereas the HSEES didn't have a non, it didn't have petroleum components. And we still had state partners collecting data from 2010 to 2012, but we went back to seven state partners which were Louisiana, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, Tennessee, Utah, and Wisconsin. However, after 2012, we used a different approach to collect data, which was through the Public Health Associate Program, better known as PHAP, which is a two-year paid service training program for recent bachelor's and master level students and limited, that had limited public health work experience. And we had eight states that used the PHAP program. In addition to uh, still collecting the, the state-based data, we added a national database component where we use data from the Department of Transportation, NTSIP, and National Response Center to create estimates of chemical spills in all states, the ones that were not included in our NTSIP database. And also we added an incident investigation better known as assessment of chemical exposures component, which focuses on mass exposure of chemical spills that occur. ATSDR provides epi aid and helps state and local health departments by providing resources to perform rapid epidemiological assessments when these chemicals occur, chemical spills occur. So here's a slide. You can see our data did a comparison of school chemical incidents compared to non-school chemical incidents from 2008 to 2013. And even though it was a low number, 335, out of these school chemical events, we see it's a high percentage of these events that resulted in evacuations. We see a high percentage of, uh, of hours being, or a high number of people being, hours being evacuated and we see that a range for evacuation hours go from 15 minutes to 1,392 for school chemical incidents. So where did that number come from? Well, it took place in New York in 2009 and is equivalent to 56 days and 18 hours at an elementary school. A beaker instrument fell from the student 
in teacher's hand and release mercury. Students will move to another room. Hazmat team restricted the room and section of the hall and ventilation was shut down. There was no injuries and the classroom was reopened November 11, 2009. Our school and chemical incidents also resulted in a high percentage of incidents with injured persons, see 35.5%. And the average number of persons injured was six, and that ranged from one to 61 children or adults being injured during a chemical release in school settings. So what happened in this event that injured 61 persons? Well, this took place in Tennessee. January the 14th, 2013, which was on a Monday. I saw release at a private school. It was found that three holes in a faulty heating system, heating unit led to the release of the carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. So evacuations were ordered and students suffered from carbon monoxide poison. Students and staff were able to return to school on Friday. So the top five chemicals we found in school chemical releases were natural gas, mercury, carbon monoxide, hydrochloric acid, and pepper spray. Once again, I'd like to remind you, natural gas, uh, petroleum-related incidents were um, only collected in the NTSIP and not in HSEES, and they had to have a public health outcome such as evacuation injury, environmental sampling, things of that nature. And one thing we'd like to point out, um, hydro hydrochloric acid could be found in labs or cleaning supplies, so that can account for the releases. Um, and to, uh, today we're going to focus more on the mercury and chemical releases in lab settings, so I won't go into much detail about that. Other noteworthy areas where chemical releases occurred in school settings was school labs. You see there was 41 incidents, a total of 2,160 people evacuated and 20 people, people, 23 people were injured. Cleaning products and disinfectants, even though it only took place in 14 incidents, they had 48 injured persons. And pool chemicals only took place in 12 incidents but resulted in 31 injured persons. So this slide just shows the injured person's disposition comparing students to non-students because we want to show children are a vulnerable population and we don't want to mislead anybody. So we want to see that majority of these events are affecting children. And so we can see that the majority of the injured children um, were treated at a hospital and they were not admitted at 63.8% of the students who were injured. There was also another noteworthy area would be that 14% were treated on the scene. And the top injuries that were reported were respiratory irritation, gastrointestinal issues, eye irritation, headache, dizziness, burns, and some others that are not listed were skin irritation, shortness of breath, trauma, heat, and stress. So now we have the data. What are our future steps to mitigating chemical releases in school settings? So after all these webinars that took place with the ICTW in 2011-2012, we did develop a report which could be found on our uh, website. The report basically has a manuscript of is a manuscript of proceedings and it summarizes the key findings from the webinars. Currently in the process we have two papers that we're working on. One is in the Q chemical release manuscript and it's going to summarize the National Toxic Substance Instance Program data about acute chemical releases. 
um, and also uses the hazard assessment emergency event surveillance system data. The data will be from 2008 to 2013. We also have a commentary that's going to focus on effective strategies to prevent acute chemical releases in school settings. We originally were trying to produce a white paper after these uh, webinars. However, we decided to switch our direction and focus on this data ministry and commentary and hopefully potentially future work on a, a white paper if we can get support from out, outside contributors. Or potentially we we're looking at looking at to developing a work group to, that focuses on chemical releases and the uh, major stakeholders can be involved. Well, that is the conclusion of my presentation. I thank you for taking the time out of calling in and then listening. Thank you very much, Ayana. Next speaker today is Anna Pomales, Mercury in Schools Health Education and Community Involvement Coordinator with ATSDR. Without further, further delay, Anna? Sure. Thank you. Hi. Good Good afternoon, everyone. This is Anna, and I also work with ATSDR, but I'm in regional office in Philadelphia. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you about mercury today. And why talk about mercury spills today? Is that each year, ATSDR and EPA, we respond to hundreds of mercury spills at schools, houses, and businesses. Um, this really just represents the tip of the iceberg. The number of spills does not include the spills cleaned up by hazmat teams and other cleanup specialists. Um, mercury spills can pose a public health threat as well as a big economic burden. Spills are very expensive to clean up and they cost on average between $10,000 and $100,000 to clean up. Okay, so ATSCR, we have developed a mercury spill prevention initiative called the Don't Mess with Mercury. And as part of this program, we're educating people about the hazards of mercury. During the presentation, I will cover material about the physical and chemical properties of mercury, where is mercury found, what are the health hazards associated with mercury, and mercury response mercury spill responses at schools. Hmm. So what do we know about mercury? Well, mercury, mercury is an element, and mercury occurs naturally in the environment in several forms. Um, mercury can be found as an organic mercury, inorganic mercury, or elemental metallic mercury. During this presentation, I will be talking about metallic mercury. Um, mercury, metallic mercury is a shiny silver white metal that is liquid at room temperature. And it is also called quicksilver. And here you can see in the picture the, the hands and um, holding mercury and you can see how why it is called quicksilver. It's just the way it behaves and as I mentioned it's the only metal that's actually a liquid form at room temperature. Um, mercury is highly toxic to children and adults in and it's especially sensitive to um, the ner nervous system. So where is mercury found? Metallic mercury is found in a variety of household products and industrial items, including thermostats, barometers, glass thermometers, and some blood pressure devices. Some religious have practices that may include the use of metallic mercury. Mercury used for religious purposes is sometimes called or sold in stores called botanicas and goes under the name of azogue. Mercury is sometimes found in 
homes and old abandoned dental offices. We've had cases um, where we've had to respond to mercury spill where children have found jars with mercury and brought them into the school. Subsequently, the children played with the mercury and spilled it throughout the school and then created um, a pretty big hazard for the students and the school and a big problem for a cleanup. So why do we worry about mercury and what are the health effects of mercury exposure? Where a person can be exposed to mercury from breathing it in contaminated air, from swallowing it, from, and from having skin contact with mercury. Yet not all forms of mercury easily enter the body. Breathing mercury vapor is the primary route of exposure. About 80% of the mercury that is inhaled is absorbed through the lungs. And mercury can easily cross the blood-brain barrier. It can also cross the placental barrier, uh, exposing the fetus of a pregnant mother. The mercury can also expose the child through the breast milk. Mercury, however, is not easily absorbed via the dermal or via ingestion. So um, by touching it or by swallowing mercury, those are not very efficient ways of having mercury absorbed into the body. In this slide, you are seeing two pictures of a case where a four-year-old accidentally drank um, mercury. Um, this was a really sad case, um, sad case where the four-year-old ingested mercury. What happened was that the parents brought a dresser at a garage sale and placed it in the child's bedroom. Um, inside one of the drawers, there was a jar full of mercury and the child drank the mercury. The child, the child eventually threw up the mercury, but in doing some, he aspired some of the mercury into the lungs. The mercury in the lungs then entered the body, causing the, po the poisoning. Um, little mercury was absorbed through the GI, um, the gastrointestinal and the intestines, but it was inhaled. And this made the child very, very sick. The child almost died, and he was hospitalized for about three weeks. And these are some of the pictures that um, were taken and the x-rays and the images from the case when the child went into the hospital to be taken care of. So what are the symptoms of short-term um, exposures at high-level concentrations? So the short-term exposures to high levels of mercury in the air can damage the lining of the mouth and irritate the lungs airways, causing tightness of breath, a burning sensations in lungs, and coughing. Other symptoms include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. The good news is that um, when such exposures occur, those acute exposures, um, if the source of mercury is removed, those symptoms do and are possible to get reversed. On, the, on this next slide, um, I'll be talking about the symptoms of a long-term exposure. Um, this sometimes happens when there is an unidentified mercury spill at a school or when students take mercury back at home and the home gets contaminated. Um, in these situations, it's more likely that you see symptoms that are associated with, it, with this long-term ex exposures. Um, long-term exposures to mercury include um, personality changes such as irritability, shyness, nervousness, tremors, changes in vision, 
deafness and difficulties with memories. Um, as you may be aware, as um, the saying of Mad as a Hatter, and that actually comes from um, hatters um, being exposed and working with felt that was treated with mercury to make it soft. And that continuous prolonged exposure that they had made them have a lot of these symptoms of irritability and anxiety and tremors. And then the term Mattis the Hatter came from that. And you probably are very well aware about the Mattis the Hatter um, um, character in the Alice in Wonder in Wonderland stories storyline. Okay, so what have we learned as public health professionals responding in this mercury spills in schools? Well, of the different chemical spills that occur in schools, mercury is one of the chemicals that gets spilled most often. There's quite a bit of mercury spill incidents that occur every year. Um, we, it's a public health concern because of the mercury, mercury vapors that can be an exposure source to the, to the students. Um, but there's all the, the other consequences that I mentioned earlier is that a cleanup of a mercury spill is very intrusive. Um, it takes um, a lot of people and cleanup teams to be able to clean it up. Many times the schools have to be evacuated and it may in, sometimes result in school closures. One of the other issues that we have had, too, is that the contamination is not necessarily contained just at the school. Um, in situations there's been where, although the spill occurred at the school, because of the way the, the mercury um, behaves because of its physical properties, that it disperses quite amply into small beads and very easily, the spread goes beyond where the original spill occurred. Also, there's been instances where the students take the mercury that they found, um, they give it to other students at the school, and then they take it home, and they take it through buses. And then what originally was a small contained spill in, in a science laboratory might end up contaminating the whole school and even households. So what may appear to be a small spill, something caused by only uh, one cup of mercury being spilled, may end up spilling and contaminating um, households and buses and impacting dozens and dozens of people along the way. Um, the pictures that you can see here on the right are pretty interesting. And this is from one of the schools that I will talk afterwards. Um, the bottom picture to the right, you see some tiles and a pen and a, something circling it. And what we're trying to show here is um, what happens when there is a mercury spill, is that it breaks up into very, very small beads. And some sense it ends up hiding um, under different tiles or under um, benches of the school. So you cannot always find it. So when a spill occurs like this, it's very important that it's a large spill. It's not a spill. You need to call in the professionals. You need to make sure that the children leave the room and that the spill gets um, contained so it doesn't occur. Um, any additional spreading. This is a case example that I just wanted to mention very shortly. This happened at a school in Washington, D.C. It's called the Balu High School Mercury Spill. And the pictures that I showed previously come from this um, response. The EPA Region 3 um, had the lead in the responding to this um, incident. 
um, in this case, it was one cup of mercury that was filled. It was brought inside the house, and then it was um, shared between students. And along the way and during the day, it got spilled inside the science lab, got spilled in the cafeteria. Um, on the way back, it went inside the school buses and ended up also going into houses. So when the time of the cleanup to go in, um, they needed to evacuate the house. They needed to um, put those buses out of service to be able to clean it up. And sometimes some of the items that are contaminated can be cleaned up. But in many occasions, a lot of those um, items that are contaminated with mercury, there's not really a good way of cleaning them up. And then we'll have to be disposed of. Um, so um, those are just other um, casualties or things that occur when spill, mercury spills occur. And here, and this is just another picture of um, uh, cleaning up of what it looks like. You see somebody here in, in, the, in his PPE cleaning the school bus and outside just to give you some visuals of what a cleanup looks like. Um, here's another picture, too. This was at a household on the left. It's like what the house looked like. And there was just some mercury in different places. Then after cleanup, basically, the contamination spread out basically everywhere. And it just had to be removed. And a lot of the materials just had to get disposed of. So in response to all this work that we've been doing, um, responding to these incidents, we realized that there was a lot of information available out there about the danger of mercury, yet there was almost no information or resources out there that were appropriate for the spill scenarios that we were encounter. So the team worked on a series of responses and resources that would fill this gap. Um, in 2010, um, 2008 and 10, sorry, um, ATSDR launched the Don't Mess with Mercury Spill Prevention. And the goal of the initiative was to educate people about the hazards of mercury, minimize the risk of having spills, and teach children and adults on how to respond if a spill occurs. Um, one of the first products that created was the Don't Mess with Mercury public service announcement. Um, because of technology here, I wasn't able to show you the video. But uh, if you go to this website, you will be able to see it. It is a 30-second 30, 30 animated video showing a jar of mercury getting spilled and forming the outline of a skull, which is similar to the poison symbol of skull and crossbow. Um, next, time, next, the mercury is shown covering various articles such as clothes, backpack, and a video game controller. The mercury is then showing vaporizing and a body breathing in the vapors. The key messages of the video are that although mercury looks very cool, it is not. It would trash all your things. So if you find it, don't play with it and find an adult. Um, these PSA, 30-second PSA, the target audience for the video and for the announcement was middle school age um, children. And it, it, we chose this target because of, in our experience, it was mostly um, kids around this time that were the ones that were bringing in the, the, the mercury or somehow had um, a lead role when the mercury spill occurred. So um, that was the intended audience. Okay. And after that, I'm just going to try to run pretty quickly. You can check out the website um, yourself. But there's just still want to mention some of the materials you were you will find that find there. 
Um, the Domus with Mercury is basically a, a one-stop shop to find all sorts of information for different audiences related um, about what are the health effects and what you can do to prevent a uh, mercury spill and what you can do if a mercury spill occurs. Um, one of the things that we have is this mercury-free school policies. And this section, it's for schools to perform audits and has a checklist for teachers to, um, and other staff to identify sources of mercury in school. It also has information on what to do with these items until they can be safely disposed of. It also contains a list of alternatives to products containing mercury. Um, the student's web page, this section was designed for their younger audiences. The products are written at a lower grade reading level and are visually appealing. The products include various learning and interactive resources, which we will go over in the next few slides. I see that we only have 42 minutes, so I'll just go over. So this is a student, sta um, student page. Um, about mercury and your body, and it's an interactive um, activity showing the health effects associated with mercury poisoning. If you click on the different parts of the body, um, will pop up information on how these body parts get affected and, and the associated symptoms. It will also show the effect is related to exposures to high concentrations of mercury in a short amount of time, or if it's associated with a prolonged exposure to lower concentrations of mercury. There's also a web-based video game which is played with a computer keyboard. It requires students to successfully answer questions on mercury, its health effects, and its dangers. Players advance to the next level after correctly answering a series of questions. And then we also have materials for teachers. We have some lesson plans that are interactive to engage students and hold um, to their interests. Um, Students can develop a public service announcement that can be played over the intercom of their school. They can develop a PowerPoint presentation. They can show at school or assembly. Or they can write an article for the school newspaper about mercury hazards. The lesson plans meet science and common core standards. They contain everything a teacher needs to present lessons to the students. And um, this is um, the last slide that I have, and it has my contact information. I'm here in the Region 3 in Philadelphia. And also you may contact um, Dr. Michelle Waters. She is out of the Chicago office, and she's been working for a long, long time on this project and has um, a lot of experience um, working with mercury spills in schools and in other settings. So. Here's our contact. If you have further questions or are interested in us sharing this information at districts, uh, the different districts, we are willing to work with you to provide this information. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Anna. That's, that was very informative. Um, our last uh, presenter today is Dwight Peavy. He is a senior scientist in the Boston Regional Office of US EPA and a visiting scholar at the Department of Chemistry from Brandeis University. Uh, with that, we are going to turn the floor over to Dwight. Thank you, Doug, and thank you to all who have signed on to this webinar. Um, I'm trying to change to the next slide. Not very successfully. We'll get you here in a second. There we go. Okay, and again, I'm out of the regional office of EPA, and I'm going to talk to you about what the first speaker had referred to, integrated chemical management, and how that will help uh, school systems 
uh, properly manage their chemicals. Uh, integrated chemical management is a systematic approach. Basically, we had been challenged by uh, local fire departments and other responders to help them deal with situations they knew were not correct in schools when they did their annual walkthroughs, but they didn't have the expertise to basically assist the schools and set it right. Uh, integrated chemical management deals with the chemical from cradle to grave. There's an important component, and that's the ownership of the program. Also, it will help move the school to safer and healthier environment once they know what they have on site. And I believe this is the critical factor. Until you go into a school and systematically identify all the chemicals, including mercury and mercury compounds, you um, don't know exactly where the hazard is and how to properly manage it. I've had 12 years doing this. I've been into approximately 120 communities. Uh, every year now, about a quarter of a million students, as they go pass through those labs and those uh, classrooms where they conduct labs, are healthier and safer because of um, less exposure. This program is uh, unique in Region 1. We actually provide on-site free assistance during the summer to start the process of helping the school to collect, screen, inventory, and properly store their chemicals. In this process, we find many chemicals that are unwanted, extremely hazardous or toxic, such as mercury, mercury compounds, cadmium compounds, outdated, contaminated, or inappropriate. We as an agency don't specifically advocate a particular list, but I often send schools to the American Chem Society. They have a list and they put out in the paper basically saying these uh, chemicals they believe are inappropriate. Also, we further help them screen the waste chemicals because some of them is, are RIC or hazardous waste chemicals that can't be disposed, they have to be removed by a hazardous waste company. So once you know what you have, just like in managing your finances, what you know your total debt is, then you can start taking action in re or relation to the chemicals. And when we do the inventory and create the database of the chemicals, it's each, each individual jar and packet. So it's a real-time database. And that's why ownership is critical in this program. Um, what we also found out through the referrals we were getting that there were very few trained practitioners of safe chemical management. Uh, chemical storage, as you're going to see in school, is a real problem. The National Science Teachers Association uh, pointed out uh, several years ago that it's a problem that needs to be addressed. Currently, the program has more customers than capacity, and it's by word of mouth. Other schools talk to other schools. They're at meetings. They're having a problem, or they're, they've had a state inspection, and they get basically uh, an email or a phone call, or sometimes they personally come and see me. We give preference to EJ communities in the state and federal referrals. My team is myself, EPA volunteers, and college interns. I'm the lead chemist and always present. There is little or no funding for the program. We do use supplemental environmental projects. Those are the fees that a company would pay under an enforcement action to safely remove chemicals from schools. We recently had a quarter of a million dollars, and we were able to safely remove uh, many chemicals from about 60 school systems. When I say chemicals are everywhere, I mean everywhere. When we go into a school and we screen the school, in this, it's primarily the science department, we look everywhere. Drawers, cabinets, photocopy boxes, storage containers, so that when we leave the school, we feel we're at the 99% level of a, having identified and addressed every single chemical. When you start looking, and I, I recognize one of the photos that the, our first speaker had was actually my photo when I walked into a chemical storage area. And as I was looking down the line of this photo in the upper right-hand corner, there's actually a wire that's live and exposed. You're not just dealing with chemical issues. You're also dealing with safety issues. You're dealing with safety issues of chemicals that may have been there 30, 40 years. You're dealing with water-reactive chemicals. People, if you focus down on the 
lower right hand corner, yes, that's a baby bottle and someone was using it for chemical storage because obviously they no longer need the baby bottle. And you'll recognize Pepsi bottles, Coke bottles, tea bottles, uh, drinking bottles that are used for chemical storage. Totally inappropriate. You'll also find many chemicals, sometimes waste chemicals, in a hood so the hood can't be used for its intended uh, function. The challenge is interesting. Every school presents an interesting uh, challenge. We had two schools back to back in the classroom in a glass cabinet unlocked a pound of potassium cyanide. If that were to be acidified in either of the school systems, the whole school would have been taken out in the surrounding community. We also find lecture bottles of gases full and empty. They'll roll in a jar in a, a drum. We collect those. We find old chemicals. I often smile when I find chemicals that were made at the turn of the century, not the last century in the 1890s in Boston by J.T. Baker. We also find many chemicals that are carcinogenic. We find mercury compounds. The state of Massachusetts has a law that prohibits the, uh, any mercury compound or elemental mercury in school. To date, out of those 120 systems we've been in, we've only found one that was truly mercury free. And it's very difficult unless you systematically go through everything to, to identify where the mercury can be. Very strong oxidizers that may have been used in curriculums that are no longer required. Um, the next example is inappropriate chemical storage, incompatible corrosives stored together. Obviously, the fumes were not being vented, so the acids and the strong bases got together. And that's not snow or ice, even though I'm in New England. That's salt in acid storage cabinets that oftentimes have more non-acids than they do acids. And then, again, if you look at that cabinet, that top of that cabinet was designed as a working surface, not as a storage surface. One of the other things we're finding is many of the school systems are leaning towards over-the-counter products, feeling that they're less toxic. But they, too, have become a problem because of the number of these products that we're finding and where they're being stored. They're often being stored where we find them in the homes, under the sinks, and I use that plural. I also find incompatibles, the ammonia with the bleach being stored together, uh, strong bases being stored together. You can go to the large warehouse uh, stores and you can buy muriatic acid, which is basically concentrated hydrochloric acid. So we have many, many examples. Also, when I've had principals or superintendents walk through this when the process is happening, they're aghast because this represents money and resources and potentially hazardous waste that has to be removed from their schools. The next problem that we're seeing uh, that's mounting is kits. Many school systems are buying kits, and you can see kits on the left lower and the right lower in the boxes. You also can see these little dropper bottles. And if you notice the one in the upper right-hand corner, it's concentrated sulfuric acid. But it's inappropriately stored. Sulfuric acid is not black. Basically, the rubber stopper has been eaten away. And someone trying to take that out could easily knock it over, or the stopper itself would disintegrate. And oftentimes, we find when one teacher is left, the other teacher will pack up all their solutions that they no longer want, place them someplace because they're not theirs, and there's no accountability. We go through every dropper bottle, every solution, and separate it. And we separate it in whether it's a solid liquid waste and also separate out those chemicals that have the characteristic of a RICRA hazardous waste that have to be removed by a licensed company. All right. Come on. <laughs> It's not changing. All right. There you go. Uh, and uh, our previous, our first speaker also represent, uh, talked about the importance of knowing what you have. And one of the things that we developed was an Excel spreadsheet. We call it our ICM chemical inventory spreadsheet. Every container of chemical is inventory, the chemical name with solid gas, 
as I call it, what's the social security number of that chemical, it's called a CAS number, who the supplier was, the maximum amount, because this information is often shared with the fire department, and the fire department wants to know the worst case scenario, whether it contains this glass, plastic, metal. In a logic field, if that chemical goes into a waste stream, is it a RICRA hazardous waste in the code for it? Prior to uh, the end of 2013, we also included the NFPA uh, code for health flammability and reactivity, which was a scale from one to four. Uh, but now we've been uh, globally harmonized. And because we've been globally harmonized, the question is, are the teachers who were required to have training translating this to their labs and their demonstrations? Much easier to translate this because there are two signal words on every label, every SDS, which many of us know as an MSDS, in the packaging uh, label. It's danger, warning, or it, there is no signal word because it's non-hazardous. This is the signal. The danger word should alert the teachers to look at the specific pictograms to see why it is danger. Now, if you want something that's flammable, you're buying alcohol because you want it to be flammable, having the pictogram for flammability shouldn't arouse any you know, ri uh, real risk if you use it properly. But if along with that, you also see it's toxic or acutely toxic, can you substitute another chemical? Also, the global harmonization scale is from five to one, and one is the worst. And that's translate to the NFPA4. Also, they are required on all label in the SDS to give the hazard statement and precautionary statements, which could be easily put into the laboratory instruct instructions to help the students better handle the chemicals. These are the pictograms. Some of them are, are not pictograms I would have selected because of flammability and the oxidizer, which is the flame over a circle seems to be a little confusing. I'm often accused of being the exclamation point, which is an irritant. But these nine give a pictorial warning to the teacher or the user of the chemical. And what we're finding is we're not seeing these symbols, and we're not seeing the teachers totally understanding the signal words and acting appropriately. Old and new problems, as I said before, the uh, laboratory kits and demonstrations, things that were purchased, never used. They were used, but they were not consumed, especially the kits. They're everywhere. They're unsecured. And the kits had the bottles in the kits laying down. And once the seal has been broken, the teachers put them back in those same kits, lay them down, and what we're seeing is leaking. The solution is transfer them to a tray, break down the old kit, refill those that are frequently used, and properly store them. But another key is now in a global harmonization. If the kit includes ingredients that are danger, why are they danger and how are they being used? Are you being exposed or are you exposing your students to it? The root cause, um, it's a sign of the times. We see uh, safety plans, but they're not functional. They're not being exercised. They're not being used. The teachers are not being required to read it. We also see very few uh, staff people who are designated for environmental health and safety. The risk associated with the chemical is not appreciated, and I don't blame the individual teachers. I blame the system. We see very few waste management programs which are dealing with those chemicals that are of a high risk. There is a lack of training. And just like myself, if there was no state troopers, would I do the 55 miles an hour? Probably not. If there's no accountability or control, uh, the chemical management systems have a tendency to uh, basically de decay back to the ground level. And I say that because many of the schools that we have assisted did do chemical cleanouts, but they didn't address why they needed to do chemical cleanouts, and that's because there is a need for the change of the culture. So recommendations. Oversight and control of the chemical procurement. If you already have it and you have a real-time database, why are you ordering it? Prohibit or authorize high hazard chemicals. There are sometimes needs for a specific chemical that would be marked danger. Audits, the accountability, have a team, teachers go through 
and evaluate the chemical management in everybody's classroom. Also, every laboratory demonstration and every laboratory that's conducted, the prudent practice is that you've done some type of risk assessment. I'm not talking a 20-page document. I'm talking a one-page document where you score for the equipment, you score for the, the danger, you score for the chemicals, and then you look at that score and see if there's ways so you can reduce that. We do need additional support and funding for chemical safety and tox training. And then the other thing I am the strongest advocate, and that's the change of the culture, is the science lab or chemical safety manual or protocol that is specific for your school, your equipment, and your teachers, which gets revised yearly so it becomes a working document and every teacher is required to read it and sign off at the beginning of each year so we're all on the same page. I'd like to thank you, and uh, again, I don't know, Doug, if we've got time for any questions. We do got time for a few questions, and we did get some uh, come in. The first one is for Ayana. What's the full name of the interstate group that you spoke about in the first few slides? Ayana, could you answer that? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. It's the uh, Interstate Chemical Threats Work Group. Okay, great. The Interstate, one more time. Interstate Chemical Threats Work Group. Chemical Threats Work Group, thank you. Yes. Uh, we did get another question here. There was some uh, interest out there about the green chemistry programs that Connecticut has for schools and uh, other things uh, that schools can do to promote safer alternatives. Um, I don't know, uh, Dwight, could you help us out with that one? Uh, there are awesome institutes. Uh, there's one that we have up in New England and I often send teachers to. It's called Beyond Benign, and it's beyondbenignoneword.org, and you can check their website, and you can download the drop-in replacements for uh, certain chemical labs il illustrating the same point. We also have, uh, uh, there are several state programs, depending on what state you're in, there's many different places you can go. Or the other thing is you can easily Google a particular type of experiment and say alternative. And that, you, that will bring it up on the web. And then you look at the chemicals they're using, obviously, to assess is it of a less risk, therefore it would have less danger with it. Okay, thank you very much. And you did talk about international harmonization. We did get a question here about uh, the international uh, harmonization. Those are coming from which organization and do states and um, schools have to follow this or is this a voluntary program? It comes out of OSHA. Not all states are under OSHA. It's a HASCOM requirement. Uh, those that have OSHA states or have right to know laws that have adopted OSHA's approach was supposed to, everybody was supposed to be trained. Uh, by December uh, 31st, uh, 2013. As of this summer, all labels, all SDSs, and all package labels are required to use the uh, GHS, Global Harmonization System, to have the signal words, to have the pictograms, to have the warning and precautionary statements. And those are codified, meaning there's exact words in the act, so everybody uses the same. So no matter where we're getting the chemical from, the, the signal word in the pictogram should stand out and tell us uh, what type of risk is this, or what type of hazard is associated. Is it a chemical hazard or is it a physical hazard? Thank you very much, Dwight. Um, one final question before we close out. There was a query here about the mercury. Um, how many spills did you see in the U.S.? Do you have that information, uh, Anna, on how many mercury spills we see? We may have lost Anna already. I will follow up with her with that and get the information back to the uh, uh, person who has asked that. With that, I would like to say thank you to our speakers today. Um, for this session. This uh, session has been recorded and will be posted on the NCSL website at ncsl.org. And with that, I want to wish everyone a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.